Good evening and happy Sabbath. Welcome. We are an hour early. Hopefully you got the memo and you've tuned in with us. And if not, then you'll watch whenever it's time for you to turn on and watch. We're going to start with hymn number 439, How Far From Home. So if you want to look up that in the Adventist hymnal, 439, How Far From Home. How far from home. But we still believe, we still believe we're nearing home because a day is as a thousand years in the Lord's time, hey? Yeah, really, we're still near to home. Welcome and happy Sabbath or happy almost Sabbath from wherever you're watching. We are joining you from Kurrenbong in New South Wales, Australia at Sunnyside Historic Home. And you're going to hear a little bit more about that in a moment. But um, first, I want to introduce to you everyone who's here in this room. And um, we will learn why we're coming to you from this home, uh, from Dr. Lindsay a little later. So let's start with Dr. Alan Lindsay over here in the back. He's the only one with a different surname here tonight. <laughs> Dr. Alan Lindsay, you may recognize his face from the Keepers of the Flame series many moons ago. And um, good to have you here, Dr. Lindsay. Good to be here, thank you. Yeah. I just rang him last week. I said, Dr. Lindsay, we're coming back. Are you able? And um, we're so grateful that he is in good health and willing to sing and speak this evening. Beside him is 
My mom and this kid's grandma, Marjorie Enderman. <laughs> yeah, she and I flew down here this morning. So good for, for you to be here, Mum. Good to be here. Yeah. Next to her is my brother, Alan. He's the closest to me in age in the family of six kids. Alan Enderman, in the back. His dear wife, Lizzie. Hey. That's right. Now, we'll start with Isabella. <laughs> She's the oldest in this family, Isabella. Elijah. They're a quiet bunch, aren't they? <laughs> Abel. <laughs> and over the back, the newest addition to this family, Kezia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome. So, Papa Lindsay is our rente granddad. <laughs> so, good to have you with us and in this family tonight. We're going to ask Dr. Lindsay if he would pray and uh, welcome God's presence for all of us, and then we'll sing some more. Let us bow our heads. Dear loving Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to come together tonight. We thank you for this wonderful family. And uh, we ask, dear Father, for your presence tonight. Mm -hmm. We have so much to sing about as we think of the seriousness of the times and the hope that we have mm -hmm. that one day soon Jesus is going to come. Mm -hmm. So bless us all together tonight and bless those who are listening that they may join in with some of the wonderful songs that we should sing together. Mm -hmm. And we ask this tonight in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Thank you. So, if you were tuned in in time for that first song, you're going to probably get the hint. We're going to be singing some of the early Advent hymns. So these kids have learned a lot of these songs and are here to share them with you. Um, so the next one is 441. I saw one weary, 441. And I also want to take this time to thank the Adventist Heritage Centre for the invitation to come back here to Sunnyside and do the Sabbath sing-along from here. So big thanks, David Jones and your team. <laughs> I'm going to invite one of the team on a little later as well. So, Hymn 441, I saw one weary. <laughs>
great hymn. And what makes that song extra special is Annie Smith, who wrote it, who writes Smith's sister, is the first verse is about Joseph Bates, the second is about James White, the third is about Jane and Andrews, and the last one is about all of us. So when we know who they're about, I think it makes it even more special. Isn't that something? So who are they written about in which order again? The verse one is yep. Joseph Bates. Joseph Bates. Verse two is James White. Uh huh. Verse 3 is Jay and Andrews. Yes. And verse 4 is about all of us. Wow, isn't that something? Nice, nice. Alrighty, very next hymn in the hymn book is 442, How Sweet Are the Tidings. I also want to encourage you, if you um, know people who usually watch the Sabbath sing-along and you, they're not here because we've started hour earlier, feel free to tag them or reach out to them and remind them that we are already going live. That would be super helpful. Or share, go ahead and share that. That would be so helpful. Here we go. How sweet are the tidings that bring the pilgrims here as he wanders in exile from Are you hearing the bass? Yes. Nice to have you singing 
with us that part. Lovely. <laughs> Do you know Dr. Alan Lindsay used to sing in a choir here at Avondale College, it was then known as. These two sang in the <coughs> same choir, my, my, our mom and Dr. Lindsay. We had a wander through Music Hall today. College. We saw a picture on the wall of your college choir in their college robes um, and all their names were signed underneath and mum was like oh I didn't sign it I said, well we need to pull it apart take the glass out and have you sign it now. <laughs> but she found her signature we oh, found yours true. but look what we also found up on the wall <laughs> Doing some voice lessons. Well, it could have been that's who was it with, with Jenny Kilroy? Jenny Kilroy, yes, it? that would be. I learned to sing well back there, yes, then uh, with, from Mrs. Kilroy. That's true, mm. isn't that wow. something? Hey, there they are. Oh, let's get closer. There you go. Let's get a better look there. Oh, yeah, <laughs> precious. So nice. That was borrowed with permission. Borrowed yes. with permission. I didn't just steal it. <laughs> Dr. Alita King was in the building at the time, and I said, may I take that to the Sabbath cell? <laughs> so, look, I would love for Dr. Lindsay to share with you right now just um, a little of the history um, of this week uh, in the Adventist faith, the early Adventist believers, why we're in this home, and... I'm not sure whether, if we're all quiet, whether the, his voice will carry, or if you say it's a little too soft, whether we just pull the screen right up to him. Dr. Lindsay, just say a few words of greeting and they'll tell me whether they can hear you clearly. Well, I feel it's a real privilege to um, be here tonight and I hope the things that I'm about to share will give meaning to why we are so happy to be singing the great songs about the second coming of Jesus. Mm, yeah, indeed. So just let me know, is that a little soft? If so, we're just going to move that camera forward and get it right up to him so you can hear him clearly. Can hear him, says Sparrow. Now, Sparrow, I need an older person to also let me know if they can hear him. Good? Oh, good. Thanks, Joanne. Lovely. Well, we're just going to sit as quietly as we can hear clearly. Thank you, Adele. Yes, Jenny. Okay, Dr. Lindsay, share with us to your heart's content. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. Well, there are very good reasons both for the timing of this talk tonight and uh, also for the place that we're doing this filming in. And I hope I'll make that clear because it's going to help you to understand what wonderful things have been happening uh, as far as our history is concerned. To introduce our presentation tonight, I want to draw attention to some words from God. Someone is saying it's times. too soft, so I am just going to interrupt you and bring that closer to you, Dr. Lindsay. Right. If anyone says it's too soft, I hear you. One second. Oh, there we go. Let's try that. Right. Mm -hmm. Good. First of all, I'd like to draw your attention to some very important principles that God outlined to his people, in the, particularly in the Old Testament. Because he gave uh, some words several times in the Old Testament that God's people, particularly parents and grandparents, were to never to stop telling about the past great deeds that God had done in their history. And he told them to remember the past for a very good reason. And I'm going to mention that reason tonight, just very soon when we look at a psalm. Among the commandments that God gives us is one that I love so much. In Psalm 78, Psalm 78 happens to be the second longest psalm of all the 150 psalms. And in that psalm, God says in the first few verses, tell you parents and grandparents to tell the great things that God has done in the past so that you don't forget those things that God has done in the past. And in verse 7 of that same psalm, God gives the reason because he wants the children and the grandchildren to set their hope anew in God. Mm. Keep that in mind, would you? Mm. Anew in God. And there follows in that psalm 
because I said it was the second longest of all the Psalms, about nearly 70 verses where God reminds his, the people of the great things that God had done for them in the history of the people. He mentions many of the great deeds like coming through the Red Sea, remember? And the other great events, feeding them with the manna, yeah. drawing water from the rock. But the tragedy of that psalm is that after God reminding them of this event, it says, but the people forgot. Yeah. Yeah. But the people forgot. But the people forgot. And that's one reason why God reminds us, as well as them back there, yeah. that it's important to remember the great events that God has done in our past history so that we can set our hope on you in God, which we certainly need to do mm -hmm. in today's very troubled world. Mm -hmm. As um, Sandra has mentioned, the reason for our getting together tonight is for a very important reason. Because last Tuesday happened to be the 180th year from Tuesday, mm -hmm. October 22, 1844. Wow. Even a what happened on October 22, 1844 as a very important event that we must remember today and not make the mistake where God says that the people forgot mm. the great things that God has done. 180 years is a long time ago, but we must not forget, and I hope I'll give you the reasons tonight why mm. that is so. There happened to come in that time on October 22, 1844, a great movement that began to emphasize the second coming of Jesus and the great hope that that brought with us. Yeah. So let me explain this, some events. In the late 1700s, many people were amazed as they studied the Bible, and this is a lot of people from a lot of different religious persuasions, began to notice that the book of Daniel was prophesying things that they had just seen happening in history. And that aroused their interest in the book of Daniel. Yeah. And in the early 1800s, they realised that that book of Daniel was a very special book because of the prophecies that it contained. Yes. The one that they focused their interest on, and these were hundreds of people, particularly happening in America, but happening in other places as well, uh, they noticed that that book of Daniel gave one chapter that was very, very relevant to the times in which they were living. In Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14, they found that that was the longest and the, the, uh, the, yes, it was really the most important chapter in the whole of the Bible in terms of prophecy. Because Daniel 8 contained the longest prophecy in the whole of the Bible. That's right. Mm -hmm. And also in Daniel uh, chapter 8, God commissioned the leading angel in heaven, if this was so important, that he should come down to Daniel and explain this longest time prophecy. Well, if we turn to Daniel 8 and verse 14, let me read to you what the text says. And he said unto me, then unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Yeah. And these many, many Bible students began to study to see what that text meant. Yeah. Well, I'm going to have to cut this long story short tonight, but let me merely say that that text, they began to study, and there was one man in America, a man named William Miller, who was a Baptist man. Yeah. He studied this prophecy particularly, but he didn't know that there were literally scores of other people in and around the world, but particularly in America, who were studying the same text. Mm. What did the text say? Under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. That text moved, began to move in a mighty way, in William Miller's heart particularly, yeah. because he said, well, what does that text mean? And in his study, he said, well, under 2,300 days, he, he, he knew that, it was widely accepted by many Christians that when the Bible prophesied the future, days represented years. So it was a prophecy that concerned 2,300 years. But then he had to deal with, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And he wondered what the word sanctuary meant. Mm -hmm. And he found as he studied the, the Bible, the whole of the Bible, because he was a man well read in the Bible, 
that the sanctuary is a word used to refer to a number of objects and things in the Bible. He looked at the whole seven of them particularly, and he dismissed five of the seven because he said, well, it can't refer to these things because they can't be cleansed. Mm. But he found two words, the earth and the church, were referred to sometimes as the sanctuary. And he said, they are going to be cleansed because the text says, under 2,300 days or years, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Mm. And so he began to realise that what was meant by the cleansing of the sanctuary, cleansing of the earth and the church, and he said, well, the Bible very clearly tells us that the church and the earth are going to be cleansed by fire at the second coming of Christ. And he drew the conclusion that after 2,300 years, wow. then the church can expect the second coming of Jesus. Oh that was a most exciting discovery. And I could tell you many, many stories, that, but what happened next was this, this man began to preach, or to think that he should preach right. that, because it was such an important event. Yeah. But he drew back from this, because he said, who's going to believe an old preacher? And who's, I have never been to a college where I can learn about these things. I, I'm, I don't feel that I should share this with other people. This went on from, 1830, up from the 1820s into the 1830s, and then a, he became under such strong conviction that he made a bargain with God one Saturday morning in 1831. In this, he said, if you, Lord, will give me the opportunity and invitation to preach, I will preach. Wow. And do you know what happened? Within yeah. half an hour, his young nephew was at the door <laughs> saying, Father can't preach tomorrow, Sunday. Yeah. Will you come and preach for him? Yes. Miller got up so angry that he <laughs> yeah. com committed it, that he entered into a bargain with God. Right. But he kept it after a prayer season when he agonised with God mm. and he accepted that invitation. Mm. And do you know, to cut a very long story again short, he, be he preached over the next few years 3,200 sermons about the soon coming of Jesus. And that preaching, soon he was joined by many ministers because in 1836 he published a book of his lectures as to why he felt that Jesus was coming soon. Mm -hmm. And as he shared that book, many ministers of other churches began to read the book and were convinced that he was right. Mm. Jesus was coming in 1844 mm. at the end of 2,300 years. Yes. Well, that was an exciting discovery and for the next so many years... When he began to preach that in 1831, uh, right through into the 1840s, he realised that things were going to happen that were going to affect every person in the world. Wow. The second coming of Jesus. Wow. Well, 3,200 sermons, that was a long, a long lot of preaching he did. Joined by many ministers who also believed that they should take, preach this. And that, that meeting, that, that movement that began in 1831 and 1844, the second coming of Jesus, that came to be believed by many people in, um, in America particularly. So much so that over 100,000 people, some historians say 125,000, other historians say, oh, the number is much more because it would be difficult to admit now name how many people accepted what Miller said. Mm -hmm. But we do know that as a result of that movement, those many, many, many people began to expect that Jesus was coming mm -hmm. in 1844. Mm -hmm. It was a wonderful hope that they had at that time. Wow. And as a result of that, of that belief, they expected that Jesus to, to come in 1844 mm -hmm. Uh, as they studied that prophecy and as William Miller explained it to, to the many people who were watch, watching mm. um, and, and listening to him. Well, what a wonderful discovery it was, but I've got a, I'm very sad to tell you tonight that Jesus did not come mm. on October 22. No. That date was set 
by all the people involved, by William Miller, because they always went to the Bible to find that they, what they were preaching was upheld by the Bible. Yes. And as a result of doing that, they went and found that there was an interesting text concerning one of the seven feasts that the Jewish people used to keep every year to remember the past. Think about that. Yep. And one of them was that the Day of Atonement, which happened on the 10th day of the 7th Jewish month. The 10th day of the 7th Jewish month. And it said there that on that day, the high priest would cleanse the earthly temple or the sanctuary on the 10th day of the 7th month. Yep. They asked the Jewish people, when was the 10th day of the 7th month to come in 1844? Mm -hmm. And they were told he's coming on the 10th day of the 7th month, which in that year was October 22. Mm, mm, and they felt that therefore this merely pointed to the fact that the Jesus would one day cleanse the sanctuary, the mm. second coming of Christ. Wow. Yeah. And they expected Jesus to come. And that was the wonderful climax of their hope. Wow, wow. But I'm sad to say to you tonight, dear friends, that that great movement... And by the way, if you blow up the 100,000 people against the population of America at that time right. and say what would, how many would be waiting for Jesus to come today, yep. it would be 1.4 million people. Wow. It was wow. that significant that so many were waiting for mm. Jesus to come. Mm. Well, the tragedy is, as I said, is that Jesus did not come. Mm. Didn't come. And that led to October 22, 1844, came to be understood as the day of the great disappointment. Yes, my dear. It's very difficult for us to understand how sad it must have been for all those people <coughs> that Jesus didn't turn up, didn't yeah. come, They're expecting the resurrection of, the, of their loved ones yeah. at that time. Sure. But it came as a great disappointment. Mm. But that day of great disappointment how was it resolved? Well, I wish I had time tonight to really explain to you what happened, but let me merely say it to you very quickly. In that day, in that time, after the disappointment, they began to realise that, the, because people were asking, if God was in a movement, why did God allow him to preach yes, and, and those yes. hundreds of other preachers, why did God allow uh, them to make a mistake, yeah. a terrible mistake? Thousands of people were disappointed and many people left, gave up their Christian faith because Jesus didn't come. He didn't fulfill the prophecy, they said. Mm. But there was a small group of people who realising what would happen, and by the way, I should mention to you, as they realised and began to study the Bible as to, to explain why Jesus hadn't come, yeah. they began to realise that the Christian church had begun with a great disappointment. Yes, it had. Great disappointment. Yeah. And what was the disappointment oh, where we began the Christian church? They had believed that, that Jesus was the Messiah, yeah. but that Messiah um, was expected to throw off the Romans mm -hmm. and make Israel the greatest nation on the earth. Yeah. And that's what... The, even the disciples believed that in the end. Yeah, yeah. And therefore they became concerned about what, how, why, how did Jesus resolve the disappointment in the time of, of, the, of his death? Because instead of throwing off the Romans and leading and becoming king of Israel, instead of that, he allowed himself to die mm -hmm. on a cross. Mm -hmm. And that, was a, a, that dashed their hopes, led to a great disappointment. But in that great disappointment, Jesus resolved it on the very day that Jesus rose from the dead by coming to talk to two people who had passed through that disappointment yes. and assuring them that it would all Jesus was going to come, but not just yet, yes. because something else had to happen. Wow. And as a result, and let me just mention this very quickly before I close, in the, the days that followed, Many people who had passed through that disappointment began to study the Bible to find the answer. Yes. And to their surprise, 
they found in Daniel chapter 7, the chapter just before Daniel 8, where it said under 2,300 years, Jesus will, the, sons, the sanctuary will be cleansed. Yeah. They found a, a description, one of Daniel's great visions, of a judgment that was going to begin and happen before Jesus does come back. Yeah. That he must have the great final judgment to understand who people who the people are who will finally be ready for Jesus to come. That was a great discovery <coughs> when they realised that the Bible had already spoken about a judgment before Jesus comes back. Mm. Not only that, to their amazement, as those pioneers began to study the book of Revelation, mm -hmm. which is the revelation of Jesus, Jesus gave that to the church, yep. that in chapter 10, it actually predicted the great disappointment. Interesting. It predicted that out of the book of Daniel, in, you read it in Daniel 10, out of the book of Daniel, that there would become a, a great message to go to the world. And that that message, when it was received, was as sweet as honey. Mm. But it turned into a bitter yeah. disappointment after they had digested the message. Yes. And at the very end of Dan Daniel chapter 10, the angel said, you must preach again, this time, to many nations, tongues and kings. A worldwide message. Reading on in the book of Revelation, we have only one re more reference to a message to be preached to the whole world. Mm -hmm. And that message is described in Revelation chapter 14 of three angels flying in, he in heaven, giving a message to the whole world. Notice, a message to the world. And when they realised that, that it's, this was foretold, when they began to study Revelation 14 and the three angels' messages. And what was the first one, the first part of this message? If you read it there in Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, the first angel was to announce to the whole world the hour of God's judgment is, is come. Yeah. Not is coming, no, no. but is come. What they realised was, as Daniel had foretold in Daniel chapter 7, what had happened on October 22, 1844, was that not, the, not as they preached it, that it was the earth and the second coming of Jesus, but it was on that uh, time that the judgment, final judgment of the world, began on October 22. Mm. That was a marvellous discovery. And that gave reason to their disappointment. Yep. And it gave them a hope that Jesus was still coming yes. before they must, that, that judgment must continue. But still, it led to the hope of the second coming yes. when the judgment had solved all the problems uh, concerning the church and its message to the world. Amazing. Well, mm. that was the timing. Yeah. And, uh, in, on October 22, last Tuesday, Monday, they celebrated, remembering what God said. It's important to remember the great things God has done in the past. Yes. They yes. Celebrate, celebrated that that day was the day when the Bible was wonderfully fulfilled. Amazing. And it brought faith and it gave reason to the rise of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Because can I just say this in conclusion? There's only one church in the whole world to, to not today who believes that the judgment began in, on October 22. And that, of course, is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Yeah. And that God, therefore, was giving and raising up a church that would preach that the hour of God's judgment has come. Yeah. Not is coming. Yeah. And that when the judgment is finished, Jesus is going to come again the Amazing. second time. Yeah. So that was oh, a wonderful discovery. Now, uh, do you want me to go on and say that we've just dealt with the, what, the place uh, the, and the, the event that occurred, but there was also the timing. That was what was we've celebrated in, on October 22, mm -hmm. the timing of the judgment that came. But there was also the place. And to tell that, that story, let me very quickly mention it, and I'll leave out, have to leave out a lot of... Uh, a lot of fascinating facts from the time. We are filming this program tonight in the home of a lady called Mrs. Ellen G. White, 
Who was Ellen White? Two, she was one who, with her family, the Methodist Church, uh, had accepted the teachings of William Miller. Mm, mm. And she was one of the petty people and her family who was so disappointed that oh, day yes. when Jesus wow. didn't come. But two months after the disappointment, in a prayer meeting, God came to this young girl. She was only 17 years at the time. Mm. And in the, revealed to her, go, we should say, gave her a vision. Mm. Now there's a text in the book of Numbers that says, <coughs> if there is, where God says, if there's a prophet among you, I will speak unto him in a vision yes. and speak to him also in a dream. Yeah, yeah. And therefore, when Ellen White was given a vision that explained partly the prophet, why they had dis been disappointed, yeah. she never could have realised that over the next 70 years, God would give her 2,000 wow. visions. Wow. And what the history of the church has been blessed of the Seventh Adventist Church with the presence of Ellen White and the vision she had that would assure her that everything was under the control of God Amazing. and that he linked those visions and gave her the gift of prophecy and he linked those visions with the, the commandments of God. The Sabbath yes. came to the fore and the Seventh Adventist Church began to grow based upon that event. Amazing. I should say before I end, Ellen White never believed that her writings and all of them, out of, that, out of her 2,000 visions, she has written 2,000 books, two, around not 2,000 books, I made a mistake, out of the 2,000 visions that she had, she has written 150 books. Wow, wow. Covering wonderful topics to yes. help Christians. Yeah. Her writings never were given to her to accept, to correct or to, to, to replace the Bible. Sure. It, her writings were given to direct us to Jesus and to recall how much God loved the people of the world. Yeah. Wow. Uh, a Desire of Ages is the book she wrote on the life of Christ, which is the most wonderful book on the life of Christ. Other books were written that on many different topics and eventually as a result, the, the church and the world, I believe, has been blessed mm. by her ministry. Mm. In 1891, Ellen White came from America, her home, to Australia. And in 1895, she built this house we're in tonight. Yes. And in this house, in the rooms in this house, Angel visited her and gave her more visions, including a vision where she was shown that the school that we were about to build in, by the church called Avondale later, she was shown the actual location yes. of the land where this school was to be blessed. Amazing. Many other wonderful things I could tell you about. Sure. I should stop because I've been speaking <laughs> for too long. But that explained why Sandra yes. has chosen this house. Yeah. because so many wonderful things happened. Yeah. Ellen White lived in this home for four and a half years before she went back to America. Yeah. And what a blessing that stay was to the church yeah. in that time. Amazing. I should stop. Oh, oh you're such a blessing. Yes. Oh, it's got so many verses though, hasn't it? And I haven't got them here. So... What a blessing to have Dr. Lindsay share all of that history and that information. I don't know, for, for those of you out there who have um, come to Avondale over the years, whether you have had him as one of your lecturers on um, this campus here, on Avondale history, whether you've been like me, taught by him at Arise, whether you did Arise, um, I am just so grateful to be able to have him on the Sabbath sing-along when we visit here to share those kind of insights that um, are just so valuable, so valuable. Um, yeah, just beautiful. Thank you, Dr. Lindsay. Gives a lot of context and insight, doesn't it? Look at you all hanging in there too. You're having family worship with us. <laughs> Amen, says Daryl Bacon. Dr. Lindsay, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Daryl. Well, let's sing again, shall we? Um, 
I don't know where you want to go to on the list of songs next. Do we only get up to here? <laughs> okay, well, let's go straight to this one. I'm a pilgrim. Now, we're getting shortchanged on this one because we're doing it from the new hymnal and it only has so many verses, but in the original it had like a ton of verses. But I didn't quite type up all the lyrics in time, did I? So it's 444 in the hymn book, I'm a pilgrim. So we're at least going to get to do the verses that I do have. So sorry about that, dear girl. I've been a bit busy. <laughs> Okay, maybe a little more volume on that keyboard because we can we're singing quite loud here. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> I'm a pilgrim and I'm a stranger. I can tarry, I can tarry, but at night do not need to. children who know how to sit still. It's quite lovely. <laughs> it's just lovely. Well, it's so interesting though, isn't it? Hearing yes. all of that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dr. Lindsay. Alrighty. Um, the next hymn on their list is 445, I'm But a Stranger Here. Now, I'm trying to work out if I know this hymn. I think I might be learning a new song right about now. 445, I'm But a Stranger Here.
great old hymns. No, they don't get do. sung much anymore. No, 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 no. We need to bring them back. There you go. <laughs> this family's going to bring them back. <laughs> I love it. I think this one may be a bit more familiar to me. 449, Never Part Again. Yeah, I think this. getting all the solos tonight is a number of people in the room said no solos for me <laughs> so Isabella gets nominated for the solos and yes someone commented Bob just wants to join in <laughs> high soprano that is very high soprano wow alrighty we'll sing one more song and then Hey, hi Dr. Lindsay, I was at Avondale in 1980 and met Linnell, says Estelle White. Oh, Elaine White, sorry Elaine. Uh, and Elaine White knows your daughter. Is Linnell? Linnell, yes. Linnell Coven, that's right. Yes, so Elaine knew her in 1980 here at Avondale. There you go. Wow. So, yeah, we'll sing one more song and then we'll be at the top of the hour where I'll invite Mum to share the next little bit in our family's history of coming into the church. So we've been sharing a little bit of that for the last few weeks. We're going to sing now 452, What Heavenly Music. So if you want to pull that up with me, I love this hymn. Again, another one that just never gets sung anymore, but... I'm going to pull that camera closer again so you can hear my mother's softer speaking voice. Um, now, you want to share something a little first before we go on to Granddad's story. She's got a little something else, so bear with me in a minute, Mama, and I'm going to bring this back in. Oopsie daisy, coming through. Oh, it's a bit of a maze, bit of a maze. Here we are. So you can let us know what you're sharing first, Mum. Oh, there goes our little whistle. <laughs> well, for those of you who have been listening over the last couple of weeks, you will have heard how literature evangelists called on first my grandfather and later my parents 
Sandra's parents, mm -hmm. grandparents. Yeah, yeah, we get these mixed up. <laughs> and it was from that beginning mm. that our family became Seventh-day Adventists. But the, my grandfather, Sandra's great-grandfather, had lost his wife and when an, a, a coal porter came to his house, they got into discussion and he invited him to come back and stay for a week. And they had Bible studies and discussions. After which, the, um, my grandfather subscribed to the signs of the times. And after he read them, he mailed them on to my father and mother. And then he visited them in Queensland. And this letter that he wrote to my parents is dated, well, he's in reply to a letter that was dated the 13th of August, 1924. So it's just a hundred years old. And my grandfather writes in reply to your most welcome letter of 13824, and for all the love and good wishes which quite delighted me, also for the good news which you could give me of you and yours. And then he talks about family matters. But then he says, never, for th never forget to thank our Heavenly Father for all these mercies. Mm -hmm. After talking about the farm and the, having your own milk and butter and cream and honey and fruit and eggs and vegetables, mm -hmm. he said the cost of this is much lessened of the housekeeping. He said, teach the children. Jules is quite old enough now to learn about Jesus and his love. Show that he loved children and died to save all and that mm. all who believe on him and accept him as their saviour shall never perish. He will hear our prayer and help us to be good. Above all, he will give us power to resist the devil who is all the time tempting us and keeping us from being good and doing good. Mm. We must truly repent of the sins we have committed and ask forgiveness. Ask for power to resist temptation and ask that we shall not be tempted above that we are able. Repent, believe, obey. Believe in all he has suffered for us and that he will save us in the end. We must obey all God's commandments. Parents are responsible for their children and no parents who truly love their children could neglect their spiritual education. If they do, their children will rise up against them in the judgment and curse them. My dear children, I do so earnestly pray for you all every day and it gives me such pleasure when I think you are taking note of what I write and am so earnest about. For the time, T-I-M-E in capitals, may be ever so close. We do not know when, so we must try to live so that we are ready always. Remember, ask and ye shall receive. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. God takes no pleasure in the death of a sinner, but that he should turn from his wicked ways and live. For God so loved the world that he sent his dearly beloved son to save the world and all that believe should not perish but have an eternal life. Mm -hmm. You have not the strength in yourselves without you ask it in prayer, asking everything through Jesus. And then he finishes up his I have never forgotten you, dear Rex, not for a single day since you first went to Queensland. And God has watched over you all this time and given you all your happiness and has blessed you indeed. He wants to acknowledge, he wants you to acknowledge him always and give him thanks. I'm very thankful my prayers were answered and if you pray, you will be given strength to resist temptation. You cannot resist the devil without. He is ever alert and knows any weakness and comes then. Mm. I'm so pleased to hear about the children 
and that Jules is so useful and that dear Joy can also do many things to help oh. and that little Clive is coming on so nicely. Mm. Give them all my dearest love and tell them that Grandfather never forgets them and that you, dear Lucy, keep so well and yet manage your arduous duties which are never ceasing. I shall love to see more photos when you have time to attend to them, as I remember everything about your cane farm and like to know and see what alterations have taken place since I left. Mm -hmm. Dearest love to you both and to the children from us all, your ever-loving father, Walter Barrett. Aww. Now, he was at this time still a Anglican, yep. people's warden in the church. Yes. But he was obviously convinced mm. about a number of things <coughs> that he was encouraging my dad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh. before we read your dad's section, let's sing another song and then we'll yes. carry mm. back into the other. Um, so you heard her great-grandfather mention Joy and Jules. Joy Paxanos, for those of you in this part of the globe who know that name, that's my Auntie Joy, who I was named after, Sandra Joy. <laughs> Joy Paxanos and um, Clive, Pastor Clive Barrett. You knew him well, didn't you? Oh, yeah. You were named after, him. Named after <laughs> Uncle Clive, Alan Clive, that's right. right. Yeah. And you are Linda Joy. I'm Sandra Joy, actually. <laughs> she had too many children, she can't remember who we all are. <laughs> it's been a long day. Let's sing that we speak of the realms of the blessed. Yes. Yeah, that's right. We're missing a couple of people, but we've still got four part harmony covered here. They'll come back. They'll come back. and the Grenadines. Happy Preparation Day, should I say. Okay, Mom, so we're up to this section. You can either go to there or you can just go through there. Surprise us and we'll bring the camera close again. 
And then we'll do some more singing and then you're gonna meet a young lady from here at the Adventist Heritage Center. We're gonna ask her a few questions and get to know her and about the work that they do. Sorry, just coming through. Oh, okay. So Sorry. Last week you heard about the visit from W. Reed, who was a coal porter. Now, this man who's going to visit next to my family was named Hessel Freeman. And growing up, I wasn't mentioned in that letter because I hadn't been born. Right. <laughs> I was a latecomer. Uh, Hessel Freeman's name was very well known to me as a tiny child. Some months later, on a rather hot day, just after Lucy had dismissed the children from school, they were homeschooled, and was busy with the housework, she had another caller. He was the manager of the AMP Society in Bundaberg and was selling insurance. I had some insurance, and with our finances in a precarious position, we were definitely not taking out any more. So Hessel Freeman did not get far with Lucy. However, he was persistent and asked to see the man of the house. Oh, he's over there ploughing, she said, but let me make you a hot drink before you go. He was surprised when she offered him instant postum, a cereal coffee, coffee instead of tea. They talked together of healthful living and he told her he was giving up drinking tea too. She told him we were more or less vegetarians and he said he was thinking along those lines himself. Then he headed out to the paddock to talk to me. Lucy watched from the window and thought, that nice Mr Freeman won't last five minutes. I know Rex wants to finish that ploughing before dark. We didn't get many visitors there on the farm, so every now and then she'd take a look and be surprised to see us still talking. In fact, after a while, we both sat down in the furrow to rest as we talked. Mm -hmm. when, when she prepared the evening meal, Lucy set an extra place, mm -hmm. but I walked in at dusk alone. Didn't you bring the gentleman in for a meal, she asked. He's got his meal and bed booked at the hotel, I replied, but he's coming back to have breakfast with us in the morning. Mm -hmm. Well, exclaimed Lucy, whatever for? You know we can't possibly take any more insurance. Then I explained that as soon as I had firmly told him we were not in the market for insurance, he had turned the conversation to religious matters. Mm -hmm. And we talked for a long time about world conditions and the Bible. And then something was said about the Sabbath. And I told him I was becoming convinced that Saturday was the day we should keep. Do you? He said, that's just what I'm thinking. He explained that he was not an Adventist church member, although he had begun to worship with them. He added, it's a wonder you aren't one. Well, the way I'm now thinking, I hope to be, I replied. Well, so yeah. do I, he added, and we shook hands, and that was when I invited him home. Oh, you. Wow. Next week you can have the... Oh. No, go ahead. You want to go on? Sure, why not? <laughs> this is the historic place <laughs> the history. All right. The next little section is entitled Bible Study. Nice. We were ready for Mr Freeman when he came to breakfast next morning and we talked on until about 11 o'clock, still sitting at the table. We touched on various Bible doctrines and he gave us a Sabbath school quarterly. It was the first time we'd ever seen first one we'd ever seen, and he explained how helpful it was to study a scriptural topic over several months, mm. looking up a text or two each day and learning a memory verse each week. We began to follow this plan right away, and I have never forgotten the first memory verse we learned. Mm. It was a good long one. <laughs> Isaiah 58, 13 and 14. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath from doing thy pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honourable, and shall honour him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Mm. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth mm. and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. 
it seemed a very timely message from God yeah. to us. Hessel Freeman told us that he'd been searching for Bible truth for years. For a time, he had been a Christian scientist. And after that, an international Bible student, as Jehovah Witnesses were then called. As AMP manager, he once had to fill a position from about six applicants and was impressed to choose one of them who looked honest and capable. Mm -hmm. This man, Mr Miller, was a Seventh-day Adventist and brought many Bible truths to his boss. When our newly found friend returned to Bundaberg, he told the Millers about our family at Buyao and this man's mother, or it may have been his mother-in-law who lived with them, began to send us the Australasian record. We found it an interesting little church paper telling of Adventist work throughout Australia and also of a widespread missionary work in the South Pacific Islands. After some time, we read in one of these records that a mission boat had been lost and funds were needed to replace it. Wow. We immediately sent a donation to the church headquarters address in Brisbane and the good folk there were puzzled as to how we knew of this need and who we were and why and how. Wow. When they sent us a receipt, they asked if a pastor could call on us and we were delighted. Pastor Stewart, unfortunately killed in an accident soon after, came and stayed the weekend with us. He was a great help to us and we were very impressed by the fine type of man he was. He helped us to understand that acceptance of Christ as a saviour and letting the Holy Spirit work in our lives were the really important issues. Mm. Sabbath keeping and other church doctrines only followed because we wanted to obey the Lord we loved mm. and understand what he was telling us in his word. Pastor Stewart told us there were many tracts available on Bible to topics and we lost no time in securing supplies of these. As we read the tracts, we were impressed with their simplicity and clarity and we checked what they taught with the Bible and were satisfied that it was truth. So although we had some contact with Cole Porters and others, in a sense, we read ourselves into God's truth soundly and four square, just as we find ourselves today. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mum. To be continued. <laughs> okay, shall we sing? Sing. <laughs> Let's sing. This is called the Sabbath sing-along. So if you've been hanging out and hearing all these stories and staying with us, well done. You deserve a medal. <laughs> okay, we're going to sing number 617. We are living, we are dwelling in a grand and awful time, which I'm sure meant full of awe, but there are some crazy times going on, aren't they? So you can take it however, however you want. <laughs>
talking to Kizzy. <laughs> She's like, oh, that was a big song. <laughs> That's that big beautiful. Song. Ah, I haven't sung these songs in so many years. Mm. And we grew up singing these songs in our family worship. So this is just taking me back tonight in so many ways. Hey, now what about um, we get down to Jesus, I, my cross have taken. Because I, I think this is one I need to learn. Um, 325? 325, that's right. Mum doesn't use a hymn book. She uses her mind. Um, Jesus, I, my cross. Oh my, how does this go? Do you know this one, Dr. Lindsay? Yes. Oh, good. Very good. Yeah. Sung this many a time. Wow. Here we go. I don't know. strong soprano singing right here and a good strong tenor coming in you suppose the alto is just going to snuggle somewhere in between and let's learn a new song well <laughs> thank you thank you for singing that so beautifully um so i'm not sure whether it's inappropriate to ask but i don't think so because when we're little we get asked our ages and we're proud of it and when we're in between, we don't want anyone to know our ages because we're just falling apart at the scene. But when we get old and we're still healthy and kicking along, generally people are proud of it. So I have a question here from a viewer wanting to know, Dr. Lindsay, how old are you? <laughs> how, how young are you, Dr. Lindsay? Uh, I am approaching the age of 90. There you go. Approaching 90. Oh, well wow. Very old. 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 That's right. He's in his 90th year. Well, that's true. That's true. His 90 is very old. I used to think that the people who were great grandparents were very old, and now I know that they are. <laughs> <laughs> People of 70 were old. Well, that's right. We do change as we get older. <laughs> because it's all, old people are always sort of 10 or 15 years older than what we are. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Wow. 
Um, so now the last time I was here in Kurenbong was actually to come and sing for Dr. Lindsay's wife's funeral. Mm. And so when he was here on the Sabbath sing-along last, she was still around. And now this year we have laid her to rest and we're looking forward to that great mm. getting up morning when we can see yeah. her again. Yes. Amen. Wow. Well, how long were you married for? 67 years. Wow. Yeah. Oh. You're looking good, Dr. Lindsay, says Fiona. Oh. You're doing very well for 90, Dr. Lindsay. Someone else just typed. Oh. I'll just tell them that they're very kind. <laughs> You're very kind. Even though they may not always be telling the truth. Oh, he yeah. thinks you're not being truthful. <laughs> <laughs> That's too precious. <laughs> Let's sing number 213. Yeah, Debbie, we are so sorry to hear of her passing as well. She was a great, great woman who is sorely missed. Oh, how well are the kids? Okay, okay. We'll be going to 213, lift up the trumpet, but let's let's find out. How old are you, Abel? Eight. Eight? Twelve. Elijah's Eight. twelve and Isabella's fourteen. How old is Kezia? Five months. Five months. Yeah. And mum, how old are you? Forty-six. No, <laughs> that mum. Okay, that mum's forty-six. <laughs> I wasn't. I was going to leave the three of us out. <laughs> to be 50. <laughs> when you said, Mum, how old are you? I was about to say, well, we used to say, as old as my tongue and a bit older than my teeth. <laughs> but I'm a lot older than most of these. <laughs> That's hilarious. Okay, but now that we've all spilled the beans, Alan says he's 21. No, thou shalt not lie on the sun. <laughs> how old are you? 52. 52. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, I'm 49. Oh, yeah. I have to be 52 again. Oh, to be 52. <laughs> that's precious. Yeah, that's... When we're children, we say, when you ask them the age, I'm nearly nine. Yes, yes. 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 Well, I'm nearly 57. <laughs> 87. <laughs> <laughs> she wishes she was 57. <laughs> really early this morning and then our flight was delayed for an hour and we're just tired. Oh. Let's sing Jesus is coming again. <laughs> we'll have those forget from your I know, right. <laughs> and then uh, let's get ready to meet a young lady who works here. Lift up the trumpet
Now that's a more well-known hymn that still gets some mileage around the place, isn't it? Did you know that one? Oh, well, are you having fun out here learning all these new hymns? <laughs> now, everything that comes around, fashions, all sorts of things just come right around. So Megan out here is learning a whole bunch of new songs tonight. Come on in, Megan. I might get um, Gucci in. Scooch in on that seat over there. I'll get Megan to sit right in close. Right in. Yes, we got it. We got to find out. That's right. We'll let you sneak past. Yeah. Perfect. Right off the front. Yes. Right on camera. I'm not nervous at all. No, no. In front of everyone. Duck down so everyone can see me. Megan. What's your last name? Skeen. Skeen. Yes. (laughs) So Megan, the dear girl, she came in and helped us set up this afternoon. And Mm. she and mum got chatting. And mum... What, yeah. what did we work out here? That you all know one another. Yeah, yeah our oh. families are slightly connected. Oh, well, yeah. in the future, we might be able to share that bit. <laughs> but there was a time when my parents were really financially at the bottom of the barrel. Yes. Yeah. And this Megan's grand, great-grandparents, grandparents, great-grandparents, right, I think great-grandparents, great-grandparents yeah. Owned a plantation of pawpaws and bananas mm. at Bockle in Queensland, which was up the hill from where they were staying. And for two weeks, they provided fruit that was oh. not fit for market, but kept my family alive mm. when they had no money at all. Yeah. Isn't that precious? <laughs> oh, please <laughs> meet me, Christina. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. It is. That's such a cool story that I've never heard before. I and it's kind of cool how everyone really is connected in one way or another. Yeah. Which I love. So. so, you're a student here? Oh, at the University of Newcastle. Oh, excuse me, she's not I know, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I did go to Avondale University for a little bit. Yes, yes, Then yes. I'll jump shit. But I did Avondale School. Yes. Oh, wow. So, still kind of like that. I have a plot at Avondale Cemetery. Oh, um, she's ready. So she is ready. Can I get in early? No. Um, <laughs> so, you are working, volunteering? or Working, working? here at the Adventist Heritage Centre. Um, so, we are a department in the South Pacific Division. Um, and we look after all the archives and artifacts of the church, and we also look after the house that we are in currently, Sunnyside, nice. which yes. we've been hearing a lot about today by Alan Lindsay, who is behind me. Yes, um, indeed. which is pretty cool. And I've been reading everyone's comments because I've been sitting on the side, yes. listening all, um, reading the comments, and just yeah, everyone's been enjoying tonight. So Aww. thank you guys all for doing this and coming down. Thank you. And for yeah. Having us. It's been good. So tell me the Adventist Heritage Centre. Can you share with our viewers what what do you do on a given day and what is the purpose of that um it being in existence? Yeah, so I mean I do a lot during the day. I mean I'll get to that first, but essentially we are a department to preserve our Adventist history mm-hmm. um, and to encourage others to engage with it and to educate others as well. Right, yep. Um, so we do a lot. I mean, any given day it can change, yep. but I do a lot of the processing and archiving of our archives and artifacts. Yeah. I do a lot of research. Yes. We get a lot of people who come in and want to know a lot about Ellen White or the early Adventist churches. And, wow. and then I do tours here at Sunnyside. Oh, so well, this is the nice. house that I'm in a lot. I know a lot about it. Yeah. Um, I'm a little Ellen White expert now. Nice. Um, <laughs> which is always a fun thing to say, especially nice. when, like, a, I mean, we've all set our ages and I'm young too. I'm 23. There you um, go. <laughs> if anyone was wondering. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, it's nice. That's valuable because mm. I know that, that my age and older who learned under Dr. Lindsay at Avondale, learning Adventist history and learning um, Ellen White's role in the church. You know, we've grown up listening to that and then when you think when these people get older and are no longer teaching mm. or pass away, you know, like, oh, who's going to carry this yeah. stuff on and keep this relevant and mm. before us? And so valuable that yeah. young people like you are getting involved and really making sure that we understand why we exist, mm. what our purpose is, where we've come from, where we're going. Mm. That's beautiful. Oh, it's, it's fun to learn so much about your history. Yeah. Like, um, because... Uh, October is Adventist Heritage Month. Yes. Um, Dr. Yes. Lindsay was ta- chatting about how 
Um, the past week on the 22nd, it was the and like the the date of the great disappointment. Yep, yep. And um, we at the Adventist Heritage, we have a program called um, the Great Appointment. Yes. Which is what we celebrate every year, where we aim to just encourage everyone to learn more about their history. Yep. This year, we focused on literature evangelism. No. Nice. Which kind of fit into a bit of today's themes of being coal porters and yes. all that. And then tomorrow, um, on the 26th, is Adra Australia's 40th anniversary as well. That's right. Which yep. you're, you've also come down to sing at as well. Yes. So, Two um, things, one one weekend, just beautifully. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for timing that so well. So you're welcome to Av Avondale University Church, where we're leading music mm -hmm. for the Adra Australia. Adra Australia, yeah. Catch it at Avondale University or live streamed as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so everyone who's watching, which is incredible that there's so many people online from all over the world. Yeah. Which is so cool. Um, welcome. Yeah, it's lovely. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. So you've obviously taken a lot of people through this home. Mm -hmm. and yeah. I'm wondering even before we finish tonight whether we should show you a little bit around the home because the last two years that we've done the sing-along from here, mm. people have said, aren't you just going to take the camera <laughs> around and show? And we didn't. We'd hit finish and be like, bye. Yeah. But maybe this year at the end, um, we can just do a little walk around. A, little walk, a lot of people haven't been here. Yeah. But I know the first year we ever had Sabbath sing-along here, we were in the parlour room. Yep. yep. That was our first That's front. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think the second one... We were right here. We were here, now this one's here as well. Yeah. Which is a big room for everyone. Yeah, um, so we might do that. We'll still sing till nine and do our normal closing prayer. And for those who just want to hang on and see a little more, then we can just do a quick little walk around. Not a massive tour, but just a quick little walk around so that you can see in, in the... Yeah, nice little sneak peek of the place. Lovely. Yeah. And um, now I just, before we sing again, I just want to say I heard something about this being the second something in the world. Oh, yes, yes. Thank you for reminding no me. Um, I think last month or the month before, we achieved something so incredible. And we just want to thank everyone involved and God especially. Yes. Um, Adventist Heritage um, got um, Centre of Excellence accreditation which is um, pretty cool in the archiving world. And um, we are the second place in the world to get it. Andrews University in America is the only other place to have it. How about so that? for our little department in the South Pacific, it was really, really cool to get that. That's um, beautiful. Yeah. That means they're keeping their files well. And yeah. Well <laughs> it means we're doing our job perfectly, guys. That's so, so lovely. Yeah. Well, a big thank you to yeah. Megan, you and your whole team. Yeah. Um, David Jones, all the other staff and volunteers who are working here at the Adventist Heritage, Adventist Heritage Centre. Yeah. And thank you again for just inviting us, my family, yeah. Dr. Yeah. Lindsay, to come and spend this evening here. Um, representing this ministry um, mm. on the Sabbath sing-along. So, Oh, yes, Debbie, uh, Isabella will be able to answer that question. But first, thank you so <laughs> yes, much. Yes, thank you for having me. Thank you guys for being here. Oh, thank no, it's so not much. Isabella. It's Megan that's going to answer the question, actually. What was the question? The question was, Does did Ellen have a favourite hymn? Yes, she did have a favourite hymn. That's something I do know. Her favourite hymn was Jesus, Lover of My Soul. Isn't that something? So, so it's yeah. not on our list, but we know that mum knows that. So how about we have an <laughs> instrumental version of it? Do you reckon you could just do that for a minute, mum? There are two tunes. Oh, we don't know which tune was her favourite. Yeah, that's something I'm not too sure about. But <laughs> Let's have a listen.
Uh, thank yeah. you, thank Megan. you for having me. Please thank Bye. Megan for coming on and giving us all that lovely information. You are a treasure. Thank you, thank, and thank you for your hospitality today. Oh, you're just for awesome. having you. <laughs> I'll switch seats. I'll let Abel oh, come right. back. Come on back in, Abel. Oh, Kezi is in the house. <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> All righty, we've got time for just a few more songs. Let's sing. Oh, we don't know that. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, I'm so, so sorry. Do you know it? Yeah. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. I got that wrong. Oh, yeah, it is on the list. It was these ones that were pushed. Okay, we're going back. I don't have any lyrics for it, though. Do you know it by heart? We don't know it. I'll see if I can Google lyrics. Hold the fort. Dr. Lindsay, do you know Hold the Fort? Yes. Oh, wonderful. I'm the only one who doesn't. Okay. Is this it? Ho, my comrades. Ho, my comrades. <laughs> There's some great words in the old English, aren't there? on to, aren't they? That's great. Okay, so we've got The Judgment Has Set oh, um, Over Yonder uh, no, We didn't have any lyrics for that one and The Glory Song. Do you reckon we can fit them all in? Oh, I've only got ten minutes. Okay, which two would you like? The Judgment Has Set The Judgment Has Set and The Glory Song? Judgments that would be very fitting since it's about Let's October 22. Let's do it. 22. Of course, of course. You were here when Dr. Lindsay was explaining the reason of the 1844 appointment uh, date. The judgment has set is him 416. Let's definitely do this one. Let's 
let's have Isabella start this one, shall we? Jesus, hey, it's because Jesus is there pleading on our behalf. Is my blood good enough? Is my blood good enough for Abel? Is my blood good enough for Alan? Yeah, it's just beautiful, isn't it, that um, we can stand because we have that intercessor working on our behalf. Some people are afraid of the judgment, mm. right. I find, because they're aware of their sins. Yeah. But the good news, because the judgment is really good news, it's not bad news. It really and it's good is. news only because we have the assurance that Jesus has washed all of our sins away. Amen. Yep. Oh, all that are confessed are That's right. That's, right. Right. That's, That's so true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but then we have the Holy Spirit to help us overcome temptation. That's right. Yeah. So there's a way of escape from all Yeah. It's an excuse for sin. Because God be said. I think we've got time for the two last songs with the closing prayer between 4.31. Is that okay if we stick with Over Yonder? Yep. Definitely. Let's do it. Over Yonder, down by the Crystal Sea. And we'll close with a prayer and do one last surprise hymn at the end. And then if you want to hang around, we'll just quickly take you around Sunnyside. <laughs> See these chairs? Are these chairs old original chairs as well from this home? We'll find out. We'll find out. I think they are. Here we go. Come let us sing the Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, that's right. That's good. <laughs> no, that was lovely. That was a good key for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lovely. Well, let us um, close out this evening with a prayer before we sing our last him and maybe we could get the second eldest person in the home to pray to close us out. Mm. Mama Bear, do you think you can? Yes, it is a bit past Abel's. No, it's not past your bedtime yet, is it? Not yet. Not yet? No, no. <laughs> it's, we're an hour ahead down here. <laughs> so let's uh, get Mum to pray and then we'll sing that last hymn. Lord, we want to thank you for the privilege that we have had this past couple of hours of sharing these wonderful songs mm. with the hope of your soon return. Even as those 180 years ago wow. believed you were right on their doorstep, things in the world around us can't get much worse, Lord. Mm. We know that Jesus must come soon. Mm. And we thank you for the promises in the Bible for the many prophecies that have been fulfilled and the few that are yet future. We know that Jesus will come again. He has promised and he keeps his promises. Lord, we pray that we might be ready day by day for we know not when our life could be ended mm. as so many are without warning. Yeah. But Lord, we want to be safe with you. We want to have our page blotted out of all our sins. Mm -hmm. Lord, give us the strength and the courage to do what we know is right at yeah. all times, that we might honour you because we love you, mm -hmm. and that we might share with others the wonderful news that you love them yeah. and that you're coming soon to put an end to all the troubles that there are in the world, mm. all the sickness, all the suffering, all the sadness, all the wars, all the catastrophes. Lord, we can hardly understand what it would be like to have none of these things, but that is what we believe heaven will be like yes. and we want to be there. And so, Lord, we ask that you will bless each one who has been listening tonight, mm. watching, joining in. We pray, Lord, that we may all be together in your kingdom and that that day may be soon. Yeah. Mm. And this I ask in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Saviour. Mm. Amen. 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 Oh, this has been so special. Have you both been here in this home before? Yes. Okay. All righty. No worries. So we're going to sing one last song and then we're going to ask Megan to take us on a little tour. And, and if all of you want to go on the tour, we can you know, all of you as well go and learn. So, um, or if you need to pack up and go home, I understand. But we'll take you on a little tour. We're going to sing the last song. Our tenor just left. He thinks it's over. But, um, hey, Andrew. Happy Sabbath, buddy. We're going to sing 425, the glory song. 435, the glory song. To finish up. Andrew, good to see you. Well,
so much for having us in your homes. If you're wanting to hang around, we're about to take a little tour through this home. But Dr. Lindsay, thank you so much for joining with us. It's been a real, real pleasure. Yeah, haven't you loved having Dr. Lindsay on? Mm. Strong in voice, sharp in mind, and able to share with us this evening. Really grateful. Mm. Yeah. The Lord does that. Doesn't he? Doesn't he? Yeah. yeah. And our dear mother, being willing to leave our dear dad to come down here. He's in good hands. Our sister Linda is keeping an eye on dad and making sure he's not too lonely. But mum, thank you for coming. I know it's a big day, but what a treat. We'll live. We'll live, she says. <laughs> when we got to the airport, finally to the gate this morning, she was like, Rem remind me never to do this again. <laughs> airport travel is pretty serious stuff, isn't it? <laughs> but ever since the first Sabbath sing along here, I had this in mind. I was like, I'd love to get mum because she knows all the old early Advent hymns and I'd love to get this family to come. So it's happened. Thank you, Alan, Lizzie. Oh, yeah. yeah, Isabella, Elijah, Abel, and Kezia, and her yeah. high notes. <laughs> she's asleep, she's asleep right now. She gave it her all, and she's gone. Oh, <laughs> God. bless her. Thank you so much for coming. Our pleasure. Yeah. They drove all the way down here. That's why he was looking a little tired, because they just <laughs> arrived in time. Megan, thank you for having us. Mm. Oh, it's been lovely. It's great. Are you ready to go on a tour with Megan? <laughs> Let's do this. So I know David's willing to take you right now if you would like to go home. And, um, but we're, we're just going to do a little run around. So if you wanted to wait while that happens, you're welcome too. So you just organize whatever you like. <laughs> I'm going to unplug this and we're going to take a little journey. <laughs> okay. So you tell us where you'd like to start and just show us right we'll through. Right, I guess we'll go a very little tour. Okay. Oh, does everyone want to go? Oh, yes, okay. Then wave goodbye. That's true. We normally do that, don't we? There you go. Look happy. <laughs> if you want to lead the way and follow, you can. Okay, you'll come behind. All righty. Oh, we'll do a quick little tour. Hey, everyone. I'm, I'm back. Yes, yes, yes. We'll do a quick tour of this house because a lot of people haven't been here before. But well, we'll go into this room. This is Ellen White's writing room. Um, and so this is a room where Ellen White did a lot of her writing. Um, you know, she was a very well-known writer, um, which is what Dr. Lindsay um, talked about. Um, but here at Sunnyside, she actually wrote some of her most famous books, um, which was The Desire of Ages. And so she wrote that book here at Sunnyside. Um, she wrote it in the Zoom, but she also wrote it outside as well because she loved to be in nature as much as she could. Um, that's something me and her have in common. Oh, no. Nice. Um, and so she would have written with an ink and quill, or and then her secretaries, which she had four of them here, would have transcribed with an ink and quill, or with a typewriter like this one. Um, so we've got that there. But also, she was a writer, but she was also a speaker, and she would talk at a lot of churches. And this is the pulpit that she would preach at, at the Avondale Village Church, which is now the Avondale Memorial Church here in Kurumbong. Wow. It's a very big church. And so she preached from here and she also used this footstool that you guys can see on the ground um, because she was not a very tall lady and she needed a bit of a height boost. Wow. And so she used that sometimes. We'll keep moving. Then we're doing a very quick tour, the yeah. speed run of it. This is awesome. <laughs> and then this is her bedroom here. Um, and so this is her bedroom because um, this room got the most sun throughout the year. Um, this house, Sunnyside, is actually built on a diagonal to allow more sunlight into the house. Um, and so, yeah, this room is where Ellen White slept. She did a lot of writing in here, too. Um, when she first moved into this house in 1895, she was bedridden for a bit because oh, she was a bit sick. So she wow. did a lot of writing here. Uh, but in this room, the chest of drawers, the desk, and the chair are all original. Wow. And so these were all owned by Ellen White when she lived here which is pretty nice. cool. We've got a lot of photographs of her and her family on the wall too. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a nice awesome. little room in here. Um, this is her desk as well. Um, oh, how cute. So this is one of her desks. And this Bible um, is the same size of the Bible that she held during um, that vision that she had in America. Right. The story of when she held this very heavy Bible in one hand um, while she was in a vision. So oh, this dear. is 
a representation of that story. There's that view of, and oh, isn't that a great room? <laughs> <laughs> We're all following along. Yes, I know, yes, I know yes. it's late. It's late for me too. That's okay. Um, and then this is a room you guys might recognize if you've seen past previous Sabbath sing-alongs. This is the parlor room. Um, so where Ellen White and her staff and her family would come in here um, for Sabbath worship or for meetings. And um, you know, you've got the big um, push organ in the middle. Um, I think we have played that once for a Sabbath sing-along. It does work. It does sound very cool. Oh, hang on. Bye-bye, Dr. Lindsay. We love you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. Got to get him to bed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, That's David, all. for yeah. taking him. <laughs> he's not trying to be on screen. <laughs> oh, no, he's ready. He's ready to go to bed. So this is the parlor, and then we move mm. into this room. Look at that big. Which, mm. yeah. Wow. Showing wow. Everything. Yeah. Oh, we're doing such a quick tour. This is awesome. I mean, there is a few tours you can watch online. If you sure. Want to just type in Sunnyside Tour. Uh -huh. A lot of people have filmed themselves going through the house. Yes. Um, but this is the patient slash guest bedroom. Um, because when Ellen White came to Australia from America, she brought with her one of her nurses. Oh, wow. And um, during the 1890s, Kurumbong was a very poor town. Australia was going through its own depression. And so the people in this town lacked access to health care. And so Ellen White would send her nurse out to people in the community. And if they were too sick to be treated at home, they'd be brought back here. Wow. So this became sort of a makeshift hospital. And um, the very first person to be ever brought back here to Sunnyside was a little eight-year-old boy who had fallen into a pit of glass, cut his foot really badly, and um, Ellen Knight brought the boy here, um, and the nurse attended to him. He got better, and they sent him back to his family. Wow. And the family wanted to give Ellen White money, saying, you know, you've looked after our boy, you've fed him, clothed him, healed him, take whatever money we could find. But Ellen White refused, saying, you know, Jesus never asked for any money, so why should I do the same? Oh, and, um, which I think is a very beautiful story. Yeah. Very shortened story. There's a yes, lot to yes, it, yes. Um, which you can find online or through certain um, books, but I think it's a beautiful story. Oh, so, indeed. Yeah. Oh, that picture of Jesus. Yeah, it's a very lovely picture. Um, wow. It's this old original. Oh, yeah, this stuff. one's original as well. So this is wow. an original um, washstand, so owned by Ellen White as well. Nice. So, yeah, we've got a lot of pieces. You've got upstairs as well, which we won't take you up. Right, but there you um, go. But upstairs had four bedrooms. Um, and, yeah, we're back to the dining room. We've got Marjorie on the keyboard. And then... Through there, we had the kitchen and the common room. Um, now, we moved this totally did, out of the way. This is usually in the middle. Um, this is the dining um, table and chairs, which are also original, yep. uh, that we used here at Sunnyside and then later at the Avondale Health Retreat here in Kuruba. Um So, yeah, it said that Ellen White never had less than 10 people eating at her table. Oh, she was all about hospitality, you know. beautiful. She just, yeah, you know. Then you come, I mean, you can probably scooch in through here. You open up this massive room. I can't even <laughs> And then okay. this is the kitchen or a common room. And we've got um, a few um, original pieces here. This, uh, this chair and this fainting couch <laughs> is also original. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Wow. That's pretty cool. That's Sunnyside That's in a awesome. nutshell. Wow. <laughs> Oh, look at here. What you got there, Abel? Eggs. <laughs> yes, Ellen White had chickens here at Sunnyside. So Sunnyside was originally a 40-acre property. Uh-huh. And um, they had their chickens, they had cows, they had horses, they had a 500 fruit tree orchard, they had a veggie garden. It was, you know, a little hobby farm because people back then had tried to live off the land as much as they could. Right. And um, Ellen White, with all the food that they had left over, they'd give them out to people in the community. Oh, beautiful. So, yeah, when Ellen White uh, moved back to America in 1900, the people of Kurumbong were very sad to see her go. Oh, bet. Yeah. Oh, bet. Oh, yeah. wow. Oh, my dear. How sunny about side. this? Yeah. Nice little sunny side. You have been <laughs> at <is> Sunnyside. <laughs> <laughs> and this is us, did you say? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> well, so we just took over that room and... and, and I, I've, I've got to show you something because I'm a little bit excited about this. This is totally not relevant to anything much except for me. <laughs> Hello! <laughs> 
I just love this glass. I don't know if you can see it. This glass here. Close oh here. my dear, that is the most sought after glass in the world. And it's in Ellen White's home. Flannel flower. Oh, I get so much calls at that at my job for that kind of glass. <laughs> I found it here in Ellen White's home. <laughs> it's beautiful. Oh, dear. Okay, this was um, just a pleasure. Thank you so much, Megan, just for showing us through this home and allowing us a, a little glimpse into the history that you know. Yeah. yeah. It's nice having you guys here. show everyone who's watching as well. Yes, yes. Oh, righty. Kids, um, if you want to do your last little goodbye, Abel, Elijah, uh, where do we go? There we go. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Thanks for hanging in there with us. There you go, Mama. I don't want to leave this beautiful keyboard. <laughs> Big thank you to Alita, Alita King for loaning Mum. Mum does not enjoy playing keyboards at all. But this has been a pleasure. This is nice. It's a beautiful keyboard mm. and it's been a pleasure and a privilege to be able to play it tonight. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> Love you all. I don't know where to look. There's a camera. That's the camera over oh, there. <laughs> Bye. All righty. <laughs> night, night. Have a happy Sabbath.